This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are tuning in over the Internet today, and also listeners who are joining us from new affiliates in New Hampshire, Iowa, Florida, Washington, Pennsylvania, and California. Thank you for making us part of your Newsweek. In just a moment, former speechwriter and special assistant to President Reagan and popular columnist for the Wall Street Journal and author, Ms. Peggy Noonan, will be joining us to talk about what makes for a great leader during times of fear and crisis, as well as her latest bestseller, The Time of Our Lives. But before Ms. Noonan joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about her background. Margaret Ellen Noonan was born in Brooklyn, New York. She is a graduate of Fairleigh Dickinson University. If our research is right, Ms. Noonan worked for a brief time in radio. From 1975 to 77, she worked as a news writer and public affairs director for WEEI Radio in Boston. Soon, Noonan found herself writing and producing Dan Rather's daily commentary and news specials for CBS as a producer for CBS News in New York. But Noonan may best be known for her adept speechwriting skills, skills two presidents were quick to capitalize on, Presidents Reagan and Bush. She was responsible for Reagan's stirring speech on the 40th anniversary of D-Day and his speech following the explosion of the Challenger. Noonan was also responsible for unforgettable phrases such as kinder, gentler nation and a thousand points of light from President Bush. Today, she is a popular columnist for the Wall Street Journal and best-selling author, and her latest book, The Time of Our Lives, has just hit bookstores, and we'll hear more about that later in today's program. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program former speechwriter for Presidents Reagan and Bush and columnist and author, Ms. Peggy Noonan. Thank you for joining us today, Ms. Noonan. Well, thank you very much for having me on, and please call me Peggy. (laughs) Okay, that's a deal. Well, first, let me congratulate you on your new book, The Time of Our Lives. Oh, uh, well, thank you very much. It was a, a, a labor of love. It, it was just so much fun to put together essays and op-ed pieces and commentaries uh, and columns from the Wall Street Journal that, have, uh, that I've been working on from the past four months straight back to almost 30 years' time. So it's quite a collection of the stuff I like most. Well, you have been a prolific writer, so I'm sure you had a a lot to choose from. Well, you know, the book is about 500 pages. And if you want a little backstory, if you are a writer in America and if you frequently appear, if you have a regular column as I do, Publishers will come to you and say, do a collection, do a collection. And for many years, I just didn't want to. Finally, one publisher came to me and said, look, we don't want a, a, a huge collection. We want a collection of, your, of the things that you have written so far in your professional career that still have great meaning for you and that still you think are pertinent to the moment we live in. And so I wound up hauling all of these these mostly white cardboard boxes from the backs of closets and from a warehouse in Queens and opening up all of this work and going through it and seeing that it divided itself into into themes. I mean, to my surprise, there were just consistent themes for the past 30 years. One is people I miss, as you see it's a chapter there in the book about people I've either been privilege to know who left us or people who I watch from afar who left us. Um, There's a lot on the greatness game of politics, a lot on presidential politics every four years. But I just found out an enormous consistency of theme that almost took me aback. I could imagine. And, you know, going back over your old work, it's kind of funny. I, I do that often. I'm a writer. And sometimes I go back through and I think, this is the most horrible thing I've ever written in my life, and, and I, w- I, I wish it had never gone public. But then sometimes I read something that I wrote, and I think, 
hey, this was pretty good. Yeah. Um, what I found going through everything, and I have to tell you, I ruined my living room for six months because I had papers all over the floor. <laughs> I couldn't even have friends come in because they'd step on the wrong pile. I sort of, I reread everything. I was surprised. I mean, you'll be surprised as a writer perhaps by this. There was not that much that I had forgotten. I was waiting for that glorious moment where you look at piece after piece and say, oh, my gosh, I have no memory of writing this. That didn't happen very much. What did happen was that I separated all of my work into three piles. One was, I love this. The other is, I think this is good, but I'm not sure. And the other is, oh, my God, I hate this. <laughs> so that, that speaks to what you're saying because you <laughs> back, you know, you can see mistakes you've made in tone or tenor or a point of view that you felt strongly you were convinced was correct 10 years ago that now you feel, oh, my gosh, I think I was wrong on that. So a lot of that uh, uh, goes on. Unlike you, I don't go through my work a great deal. Mm -hmm. And that's lucky. Because of that, it was kind of exciting to go through my work. You know, I don't, it, it was sort of like, oh, wow, I remember this. Oh, I remember the reaction. Oh, my gosh, I remember who got mad. So since the, since the book is, is a, a lot of comments and a lot of longer essays, you really do remember the public reaction. And one part of the book is just a little lecture that I gave to college students about the satisfaction to be gained from working in the world. Well, in many ways, uh, you write as if you're bearing witness to history in the making, which is what you say that we're all doing. Uh, we are all part of history, even though we may not be conscious of it in our everyday lives. Well, yeah, I called the book The Time of Our Lives because I was impressed some years back by the very simple observation of the writer and anthropologi anthropologist Lawrence Vanderpost mm -hmm. that we have to remember, and it can be hard to remember, we have to remember that whether you know it or not, you are living not only your own life, your own individual life, you are living inside and outside your house every day the life of your time which implies you've got to be part of it. You've got to be part of trying to make it better. You've got to be part of trying to make everyone understand it. You've got to be part of the drama. You've got to take part. That's right. I That really became clear to me when I uh, read uh, Pauline Mayer's book, Ratification. Uh, and what she did was she collected all of these letters that had been going back and forth during the year in which there was a public a debate in taverns and people's homes about whether to ratif ratify the Constitution. And so right. much we uh, about what we know came from personal letters within families. Yes. The, uh, I think a lot of columnists, by the way, who are regular columnists in newspapers or in online sites, websites, news sites, regular columnists, I think, experience their own columns to some degree as a letter they are sending to their readers on their views and on how they're seeing the world as it goes by or what they overheard when they were at the big political meeting or what insight they think they gained from the speech that was just given or the public action just taken by, by any public figure from a show business figure to a political figure to a church leader. Absolutely. And we, we definitely get that feeling from your writing. We get the feeling that you are writing to us, the reader, uh, on such a personal level. Uh, and I think that's what really distinguishes your columns. Now, we're going to have to take our first break, but stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from Peggy Noonan. You're listening to The Costa Report.
If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and drag and drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most important impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau dot com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, recent winners of the best sparkling wine in the U.S. in the Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championship. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. So what is it about your Brut Cuvée that beat all the other competitors around the world? We really focus on creating an expression of the Santa Lucia Highlands and doing it the right way. And when you control the process from the beginning to the end and you have talent like Michelle and top-tier grapes, they really shine through. This was a worldwide competition. It was definitely a humbling experience. We were in a room with producers that have been making wine for over 100, 200 years and was a huge honor to have Tom Stevenson give us the best you Best Sparkling Wine Award. We fared really well overall. We had three wines win best of class, which was great. Visit the Caraccioli Tasting Room on Dolores Street in Carmel by the Sea, or find us online at caracciolicellars.com or reach us by phone 831 622 7722. Hi, Register Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. Perhaps you've seen the new commercials for shingles vaccine. You know, the one with football tough guy Terry Bradshaw describing being hit by the shingles virus as if it were being blindsided by an NFL linebacker and then showing up on his skin as a painful rash and red, ugly blisters. Then the fear factor hits full force with his statement that one out of three Americans is likely to be infected. And while Terry doesn't directly come out and tell you to go get vaccinated, the implication is clear. Talk to your doctor, and with the miracles of modern medical vaccination, no more shingles. What Terry Bradshaw doesn't mention is the unfortunate fact that it's never been shown to actually prevent shingles. True, the drug reduces the risk of getting infected by 50%, but what that bit of statistical mumbo-jumbo really means is that 3.3% of patients given a placebo got infected by the painful virus, but merely 1.7% of vaccinated patients were shingled. And, of course, being medicated by any pharmaceutical, including a vaccine, comes with financial cost and the risk of toxicity. The best way to prevent infection with the shingles virus is to keep your immune system strong and robust. Minimizing your intake of processed high-sugar foods is extremely important. Bread, cereals, and sweets are powerful immune system suppressants. So are psychological stresses. Nutritional supplements can help, too. Think zinc, along with selenium, vitamin C and E, and the wonderful immune-boosting amino acid N-acetylcysteine. Pharmacist Ben here urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos too at kscohealth.com that's kscohealth.com Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is author, columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and former speechwriter for Presidents Reagan and Bush, Peggy Noonan. And before the break, we were talking about your new book, your latest bestseller, The Time of Our Lives. Um, I'd like to switch gears for just a moment um, to talk about a recent column uh, that you uh, wrote for the Wall Street Journal uh, about how the ISIS attacks in Paris and Bangladesh are affecting everyday Americans. Could you speak to that for just a moment? Well, um, I cannot remember. I think that 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 column is very recent and not in the book. It is about 
I think the one you're referring to, since I've written a bit about ISIS in Paris, I think the one you are referring to says that that in the past um, few years, essentially, Americans have been wondering how to respond to and what to do about ISIS and seeing attacks such as the Charlie Hebdo attack in, in France uh, earlier this year. But the most recent attack in Paris is one that I think has changed the conversation from what to do to a very uh, to a more simple and declarative okay they have to be stopped how do we stop them that is the debate now yeah you'd made the point that in the past after 911 and the Madrid train attacks the Charlie Hebdo uh, situation uh, we looked to our leaders and we were concerned with how our leaders viewed these events and would respond but the attacks in Paris seemed to have us asking a different question and making a different statement. And in your article, you said that the reaction of the person on the street was, this isn't going to stop. That's right. That's right. It was, my sense of it in Europe and America was that the views, it's almost as if the people on the street did not have to look at the views of the leaders at the moment for cues on how to how to um, sort through this reality that had just occurred. The people on the street suddenly on their own were sorting through it and in a very clear way. And, and I thought you nailed it right on the head. I, I mean, I really did because that was my feeling. I, I didn't have the shock and horror that I had with 9-11 and previous attacks. What I had was dread. Yeah, and also I began that column with a with a quote from Emily Dickinson, from an Emily Dickinson poem uh, that said, uh, essentially, after great pain, a formal feeling comes. Not a feeling of passion, but a feeling of, of uh, formality. She said, your nerves are suddenly, essentially, quiet as tombs. Yes. So not, you know, it's not... It's not that your adrenaline is pumping so much as that your mind is coming to a hard conclusion. Yes, and it is a quiet conclusion, a more thoughtful one. Now, in this article, you talk about President Reagan's confidence that America can do whatever it sets its mind to. And you indicate that it was that that uh, that certainty, that confidence that made everyday working people feel optimistic about the future. But we don't seem to have that same <clears throat> certainness today. What's changed? It was a funny thing. I have been, as you can, as you well know, for you are giving me great assistance on it, I have been on a book tour for the past 30 days. Yes. And I've been going throughout America, East Coast, West Coast, up and down, talking to people doing Q&A with people, and and I must say having a ball, but that's not relevant. What was interesting to me is that people would always bring up Ronald Reagan, in part inevitably, for indeed I had worked with him, but in part with a kind, kind of longing, and I noticed with media people, with reporters and such, most strikingly, they would say, don't we all miss Reagan's optimism? That was his power. He was so optimistic. Reagan was sunny. And that since I started hearing it so much, I finally said, I got to tell you, I disagree with you. I don't think Reagan had optimism. What Reagan had was confidence. He was confident in himself. He was confident in the American people that they would always do what needs to be done. And he was confident in the American political system the way we sort of have organized ourselves to react to the world. So he had complete confidence. And because he walked into the room confident, people looked at him, and it allowed them to feel optimistic. That's why we remember the optimism of those days. It isn't what he brought into the room. It's what people felt when they looked at him. Um, And I think this is a very important distinction. Uh, to make. I, I, it, it's one that I think leaders don't completely understand these days, is that you cannot have optimism without leaders 
that are not certain and confident. There's no well, such thing as optimism without that. Yes, well, you know, what is optimism? I mean, you, if politicians sometimes become confused and think if they walk into the room uh, standing with good posture and grinning like fools <laughs> or saying, just America is great, yay, that, that that will give them the label of Reaganite optimism, and that's just not how it works. I don't think people are as confident in their political leaders as they used to be. I don't think they're as confident. I know they're not so confident in the president they see responding to ISIS. They sense something there, uh, an unsureness or an inability to share his his um, honest thoughts yes. on ISIS and what is going on in the Mideast. I don't think Americans are as confident in their institutions as as uh, we have been free to be in the past. And so I, I do think America hungers for someone who can come along and say believably and credibly with a record, my goodness, we can turn this around. We are American. Now, the Pope recently referred to these attacks by ISIS and al-Qaeda and other terrorists as a piecemeal war. And we've never really seen this kind of a scattered global approach before. And a lot of Americans worry that it means either putting up with random attacks or relenting on certain liberties that we've enjoyed in the past. Um, as yeah. an example, greater surveillance by the government and or in the case of Brussels, shutting the entire country down for a period of time. You were very close to Presidents Reagan and Bush. Uh, how would they have handled or, uh, or approached a piecemeal war? Well, I can never, you know, who can guess what another human would do who lived in the past? For me, it's almost like saying, so what would Lincoln do? However, I will tell you that Ronald Reagan understood the power and the meaning of clarity in leadership. Mm -hmm. He had no shyness about defining, seeing and defining the reality before him and us. And so he would very honestly, you know, America had had sometimes in its presidents been rounded or tentative or indirect yes. or indecipherable in its statements about the world. Reagan was not. He called it the evil empire because it was evil and an empire. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, to the extent that our leaders speak clearly and understandably to the public, uh, we get a clear picture of what's going on. And I think that that's part of defeating the fear. Now, we have to take our second break, but stay ra right where you are. We'll be back with more from Miss Peggy Noonan. You're listening to the Costa Report. Biodiversity is the very fabric of our lives. It is everything around us, all of nature. But human impact is diminishing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And because of that, the intricate web of biodiversity is unraveling in ways we don't fully understand, and our world is becoming less resilient. That's why we are biodiversity advocates. We're the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Guided by the greatest living naturalist, E.O. Wilson, we champion research and education that expands our understanding of biodiversity and informs worldwide conservation efforts. The E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation is building a movement of environmental stewards like you who share our sense of responsibility for the living world that is our home. Join us in our quest to protect biodiversity, the fabric of our lives. Visit eowilsonfoundation.org. People say puffiness and bags under the eyes are the hardest things to get rid of until now. Introducing GenuCell Stem Cell Therapy from Chamonix, specifically targeting eye puffiness and bags. Due to new technology, GenuCell is an incredibly powerful all-natural serum. And with its instant effects, it's guaranteed to show results in as little as 12 hours or your money back. Users saw results in only 12 hours with dramatic improvement in two weeks. A true Chamonix classic, GenuCell contains eight extra ingredients to significantly reduce the appearance of bags and puffiness. Plus, GenuCell uses patented plant stem cell technology to improve longevity and brilliant long-term results. Call now to try GenuCell risk-free, 800-442-3684. Say goodbye to puffiness and bags today. Call in the next 20 minutes and get the legendary Esotique face cream absolutely free just for trying GenuCell today. Chamonix, the best skincare, best results or your money back, no questions asked. 800-442-3684. 800-442-3684. 
800-442-3684. Hello, Charles Friedman here at Watsonville's Auto Row, where the way things used to be is the way things are. What do Watsonville Auto Center's small town values mean for you? Let's ask Milton Wood. Hi, this is Milton Wood over here at Marty Franich Auto Group, the sales manager and We have been in the business here since 1933. We have goodwill. We have the best relationships in the community. Our staff is trained and ready to help you. Our prices are fair, and our products are excellent. Like I said, I'm a manager, and I'm always available for you. And we always care about our customers and our community first. December is 0% financing month at Watsonville Auto Center. That's right, 0%. Up to 75 months on select new cars at each dealer. Don't wait. Take the short drive to the way things used to be and save big at Watsonville Auto Center just off Highway 1 at Main Street and Auto Center Drive. Watsonville's Auto Row, where the way things used to be is the way things are. All right, class. Let's hear what everyone did this weekend. Jill? Well, I raised my older sister to a big oak tree. It was at least a hundred years old. My mom said I must have set a record or something. And then we went down by a stream and perched up on this huge rock and saw all these little minnows swimming around way below us. And then I rescued my little brother from an evil slug king who was guarding him at the bush fortress. And my sister and I brought him back to our super twig fort for safety. And then we all laid out and told stories until it got dark. And the Big Dipper led us all the way home. Where were you, Jill? Yeah. We went to the forest. It's not that far away. Anyone want to come this weekend? (laughs) Ask your parents to take you and your friends to the forest this week and find the fun, adventurous you. It's closer than you think. Check out discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is author, columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and former special assistant to President Reagan and speechwriter for Bush, Peggy Noonan. And before the break, you were making the point that, well, no one can say what Reagan might do today. I must admit to you, I never answer the question, what would Reagan do? Yeah, that's a a good idea. (laughs) You know what I mean? He lived very much in his time. He was responsive to the immediate issues of his time. One thing we do know is that he would have been very clear. And uh, speaking of leadership and clarity, we have an interesting contest shaping up for the GOP nomination. Almost all political analysts and reporters predicted that Donald Trump would have fallen flat months ago. And this year we have not only one, but three government outsiders as contenders, Trump, Carson, and Fiorina. Uh, what do you think they're tapping into <laughs> that, that's gotten people very activated? Well, when you add, you're, you are completely correct, Rebecca, as you know. You add the national poll numbers, also the state, most of the state poll numbers, uh, with regard to support for various of the Republican candidates. If you add businessman Donald Trump, his numbers, with the numbers of neurosurgeon Ben Carson and former CEO Carly Fiorina, you get 50 or more than 50 percent of the Republican base saying, essentially, I want someone who has not been, let me put it a different way. They look at Washington the past 15 years, voters, and they see, you know, what have we gotten? We've got two unwon wars, constant conflagration and collapse in the Mideast, and economic collapse that resulted in a feeble and unsatisfying recovery. So many people unemployed stopped looking for jobs. We see cultural indicators from education to what we put on TV at night that are all going downwards, not upwards. And they say, okay, that's been the past 15 years. Who gave us that world? Oh, my God, who gave us that world is the most accomplished, sophisticated, experienced, political candidates, office holders, thinkers, activists. That's who gave us this world. So I think people on the ground are saying, okay, 
Why don't we look outside the political world for an, a different kind of expertise, different kind of experience, different kind of accomplishment? And, you know, they have a point. This is not irrational thinking. It is wholly understandable thinking. They seem to have t- tapped into some kind of zeitgeist. Do you mean the the uh, the outsider candidates? Yes, the a- the outsider candidates sure, seem to be speaking to the American people in a way that previous career government workers couldn't connect. Well, it's a funny thing. I mean, there have been colorful office holders in the past. You don't have to be an outsider political person to be colorful, but in various ways, each of these uh, candidates has has tapped into something that is desired. Donald Trump, highly controversial, often looking for battles and, and arguments and and uh, that he probably shouldn't be looking for and insulting people in a way that can be quite off-putting for many people, and yet he has a reputation for a certain blunt, direct candor. Carly Fiorina, I mean, her background is she ran for office once and did not win. She got drubbed fairly significantly in California. Um, She has had a very serious and full of accomplishment business career. But in her public pronouncements, she's straight and direct, goes to the heart of the matter, knows what she thinks, knows why she thinks it. So she is that's a very compelling candidate, I think. I'm not sure how that's going to go, but she has made quite an impression. Ben Carson, it seems to me, it is his story, his Benness, that has been moving for people. You know, I mean, this is a guy who who came from real want and from a certain amount of um, instability or lack of support, who made himself into a very great neurosurgeon and then a great a speaker on Christian issues and values. So it's understandable that he has support, too. Well, he's the great American, uh, you know, story, I mean, of opportunity. He was raised by a single mother in Detroit and rose to become the head of pediatric surgery at Johns Hopkins. I don't know of a another story like that. Well, you know, you that's know, both extremes people, right there. People are always saying, you know, in a way inviting me to criticize him. And I always say, you know, I don't know how to separate conjoined twins. And I find it challenging to patronize and criticize somebody who actually does know how to do that. Now, it, to be honest, how those, um, how that fabulous gift and how his impressive career translates into a talent for and a capability within politics I think remains to be seen, but we got some months ahead to see. We've got about six months to probably make this decision, or the the decision will be made next July at the Republican Party convention. There you go. And well, it could go that, to that. I mean, I'm totally open. All my life, people have been saying this thing could go to the convention. It never goes to the convention. You want to know something? This thing could go to the convention. I, I think you're right. I think that could be the big surprise here. Uh, it, we... we Everything that we expected, all the analysts were saying Trump wouldn't last. Uh, everything that's been predicted has been off uh, this, this round. Uh, I think you're right. I think this could go to the convention. Now, ever since these, you know, talking about Ben Carson, ever since the Paris attacks, he's losing some ground. Uh, and some analysts say that people feel safe with Trump's hard stance on immigration and the surveillance of Hamas and letting the Russians handle ISIS, the ISIS problem in Syria. What's your take on this? I mean, are are we becoming so frightened that we just are we're gonna we're gonna make it the safe vote? Whoever will make us feel safe? I don't know. I suppose people are. Uh, I'm not even sure they're rattled right now. I think people are in the stern part of their thinking where they're realizing. You know, foreign affairs is going to be a major, major, major issue for the next president. We do need someone who can help us negotiate through the shoals here, um, you know, navigate through the shoals. Uh, so it's understandable that foreign affairs would thinking would be having some impact on voters' thoughts. 
you know, all the polls suggest different things. Nobody well, it's the well, it's the first on. time. Yeah, it's the first time foreign policy has moved ahead of the economy uh, yes. during this year. Yes, and, and I'm glad it has because foreign policy is is going to be a big part of our future. By which we mean what happens in the world and what is done in the world. Well, I've said for a long time, there's no economy unless you can protect it. <laughs> yeah, it's all, yeah, it's all very complicated. There's also no protection without a good economy. Yeah, there yeah. you go. I, I guess, yeah. you know, bo- both, they, sh- they should have two spots for number one, maybe. Maybe they need to think about that. Now, you have lived through and participated in a number of presidential elections. What is it about this election that makes it unusual? Well, uh, I write so much about, uh, before I mentioned, I call it the greatness game I've witnessed over the years and that will witness in the future so many different varied individuals trying to come forward and saying, I should be president and trying to judge what they're about and trying to judge what people see them and trying to judge the moment. The great distinguishing fact of this year, I suppose there are three of them, One is that the smartest people in the room don't know what's going to happen and can't tell you. The other is the rise of the outsider. The final is Ronald Reagan through landslides and historic support and popularity in the late 70s and throughout the 80s established that the Republican Party would be a conservative one. Yes. What's being discussed this year is what does conservative mean? Yes, well, that question was certainly put out on the table during the presidential debates. And yep. we have to take our final break, but we'll be back after these important messages from today's sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, Try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Big data is being generated by everything around us all the time. Every digital process and social media exchange produce it. Systems, sensors, and mobile devices transmit it. Big data is arriving from multiple sources with ever-increasing velocity, volume, and variety. It's becoming the world's newest resource for competitive advantage, allowing decision-making to move from the elite few to the empowered many. The escalating demand for insights requires a fundamentally new approach to architecture, tools, and practices. To extract meaningful value from big data, you need optimal processing power, analytics capabilities, and skills. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash bigdata today. That's www.ibm.com slash big data. Dress up your home for the holidays with a real Christmas tree from the Santa Cruz Host Lions Lot near Costco. Lions always feature the best trees from the Pacific Northwest, and all proceeds go to help your neighbors see, hear, or grow up to be productive adults. Bring your old eyeglasses and get a dollar discount, and that's good for five pairs. Hurry for the best selection to the Lions Christmas Tree Lot at Portuguese Hall near Costco. Daily, 9 to 7. We are the Lions, and we serve. Information at santacruzlions.org. 
Hello, my name is Jackie Tucker. I am owner of a home care agency called Care from the Heart in Home Service. We are honored to provide a variety of caregiving services from homemade chicken soup to hands-on care and to continue to encourage you and support you to be independent. We specialize in dementia care and end of life. Our team of care providers are supervised by our case managers who are also registered nurses. Our telephone number is area code 831 876-8316. My name is Larry Haddis. Jackie and her crew took care of my mom for about two years. It was good because somebody was always there. She couldn't be left alone and uh, would have had to go to a much more restrictive environment if she hadn't been there because, you know, my mom would fall. And the uh, caregivers were all uniformly fantastic, very caring people and made her last uh, hours on earth uh, very satisfying. Best as the situation could possibly be. People should be as lucky as I was to have Jackie and her crew care for their loved ones. Care from the Heart is here to serve you with dignity and respect. Our telephone number is area code 831-476-8316. Again, the number is 831-476-8316. Our doors are opened 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Please call Care from the Heart. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Peggy Noonan. And when we went to break, uh, you were saying that the question of what does conservative mean has now been asked. So what do you think it means? Oh, my goodness. Well, let me tell you, I think it's going to be worked out every day over the next six to ten months by the party. I think there are conservative ways to answer any number of questions right now. Donald Trump's conservative answer to what to do about entitlement spending is essentially leave it alone. A deal is a deal. Um, That's Mike Huckabee's answer. There are others who say, my goodness, if you're going to be responsible to the future with all this spending that we're doing, with the baby boom retiring, with all this money sloshing out there, We're going to put it on our kids. That's not really a kindly and it's not a conservative thing to do. So we're going to have to cut back on entitlements. Now, that's just one question where there are many answers that can be called conservative. Do you know what I mean? Even one one in the entitlement area is, is it at all conservative to understand that the number of people in America dependent on, needful of, the social services, if that's the right word that we're talking about, that they will never vote for cutting them back. And it is not conservative not to see that reality. That can be argued. So so to me, that and as I say, that's entitlement spending. It's only one question. Another is on foreign affairs. What is a conservative foreign policy for America? So it seems to me by backing different candidates, uh, the base itself will be backing particular definition. So I guess we can look at the candidates and say, uh, in this particular case, we have such a large field, and the very fact that they're differentiating themselves from one another has created a variety of uh, nuances and opinions. And I guess the GOP base will be selecting, uh, by virtue of who they select, will be selecting their definition of conservatism. Is that what we're saying? I think so. I I mean, as I say in the book, politics is the venue in which these questions get thrashed out. And it's always a great fight, but it's a worthy fight. It's the most exciting fight. It's a fight about how you govern yourself and to what extent you govern yourself. It's a fight about what you owe the government and what the government can justly and fairly demand of you, the citizen. So we fight that out pretty much every four years, and I think the Republican Party especially will be fighting it out this year. But you also talk about a fair fight. In, in a couple of your articles, you talk about the, the name-calling, the hitting below the belt, even the media's uh, participation. 
You know, the media used to be a referee. You weren't part of the game itself. But now it seems like the the uh, moderators have inserted themselves as, you know, as a, a protagonist in the story. I, 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 this is all new to me. It is new to all of us. In an odd way, it's connected to Trump. Once the media understood the fantastic support uh, that Trump was starting to show among Republicans and what a colorful character he was, the media began to understand, wow, this fellow's going to draw a lot of eyeballs to the Republican debate. Once they understood that, they understood, my goodness, we can charge more money for commercials for the Republican debates. And then they understood, holy mackerel, we can make our new stars even bigger stars uh, by putting them forward in the Republican debate. So that is, I think, at least a bit of what happened this year. I went back a few weeks ago and looked at old debate tapes uh, from 72 and 76 and 80. And it, it was really so formal, so touchingly formal and respectful. And the questioners were wonderfully, um, wonderfully, solidly, boringly serious journalists, you know, who asked serious questions. And the candidates put themselves forward, forward with dignity. Uh, we have certainly moved beyond that to everybody is a star. But, you know, my, my father raised me believing that the media uh, had a noble role to play in politics. He called them the fourth branch of government. He said they provide oversight, and we certainly saw that during Watergate and, and more recently in the revelations uh, about NSA surveillance. But we, we've drifted so far from that. I mean, these debates to me felt like game shows. Um, I was very lucky. You speak of your father, and it made me think of the men who taught me my craft of writing within broadcasting and writing within journalism. Yes. And I was very fortunate. You know, this is the beginning of the book. There's a whole original introduction that tells people things about me and how I came up, things that I think that might be useful to others. And one is that I was very, very lucky to be entering journalism in the 70s and to be fought, uh, to be taught, sometimes fought, by, quote, old men, meaning men as ancient as 57 and 62, who had indeed come up under Edward R. Murrow and the inventing of broadcast news. And they took their mission as a a vocation. They thought journalism was a a kind of priesthood. I don't mean that in a bad way, but a good way of we have rules and traditions and they exist for a reason and we will meet them. And originality is always welcome, but we don't screw around here. We take seriously what we do. And the first thing we must do is get it right. And the second thing we must do is be fair. So they were... They were really wonderful people, wonderful old journalists under whom to to learn when I was a youngin. Well, I have to say that that was the part of the book I enjoyed the most is is following your career and who mentored you and and who uh, indoctrinated you with that philosophy because I I feel the bar has been set so low now that now when I speak to young people, I say, nope, let's raise the bar again because there was a time when news, being in the news and being part of the media was a noble profession and we can bring it back there again. Now, lastly, before we run out of time, do you have a web? Web address where listeners can go to get more information about your activities and your new book, The Time of Our Lives. Rebecca, how gracious of you to ask. It's PeggyNoonan.com. I'm afraid I don't tend it enough, but I do go there, so anybody who wants to be in touch can go there. Um, I am I am very happily and blissfully winding up my tour. You are one of my last interviews, and certainly you were a delightful one. Well, we really appreciate you making time uh, to spend with us today. I know that it's been a busy tour, and we're going into the holiday season, and we do appreciate it. And I I also want to take this opportunity to thank you for your public service and the many years that you've spent in in the news and, and bringing us wonderful columns in the Wall Street Journal. Thank you, Ms. Noonan. Oh, Rebecca, thank you, thank you, thank you for a wonderful talk. I really appreciate it. 
Well, come back soon. If you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Peggy Noonan today, you can contact me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also by using the contact page on our website at RebeccaCosta.com. We love to hear from you, and we make a point to answer every email, so keep those comments coming. And while you're at our website, let me remind you that one of the most unique and appreciated gifts you can give this season is a first edition book with a custom dedication and autograph to the one you love. So if you have a reader on your list or someone who stays current on politics and social trends, make sure you get your order in for your copies of The Time of Our Lives or The Watchman's Rattle early. Just click on the book on our website and it'll take you to an order form. It only takes a few brief minutes. And uh, then in a few days, presto, the book arrives and there's one less gift you have to stand in long lines at the mall to purchase. This year, make your holiday shopping a little easier and order your copies of The Watchman's Rattle or The Time of Our Lives. That these books have stayed on the top 1% of Amazon's nonfiction list for, uh, well, since they've been published. So uh, so make your shopping easier this year. I mean, why not? It's, I think, Cyber Monday, Cyber Tuesday, Cyber Wednesday. <laughs> when Online, they're calling it Cyber Week. Uh, that's the Watchman's Rattle is less than twenty dollars. All you have to do is go to the the uh, our website, which is RebeccaCosta.com, and do it today. And remember that one hundred percent of book proceeds go toward keeping interviews like the one you heard today on the air. If your station is leaving us after the first hour, my guest next week was the chairman of the Defense Policy Board under President Bush and Assistant Secretary of Defense for Global Strategic Affairs under President Reagan, Mr. Richard Pearl. Don't miss Richard Pearl's sobering look at the growing threat of terrorism right here on the only weekly news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Now, if you've been listening to the Costa Report, you know that I'm a big fan of wines by Caraccioli Cellars. And today I'm here with Scott Caraccioli, who's one of the brains behind the most memorable wines money can buy. So I have a question for you. How did your family get into the wine business? Um, You know, in 2006, my father, his brother and uncle were really playing with the idea of planting a vineyard and... Planting a vineyard turned into making a bottle, turned into making sparkling wine when um, Michelle came into the picture. So it was really kind of an organic situation, us being in agriculture in the Salinas Valley. And then the extension of that went to grapes, and here we are today. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, Cellars, where one bottle is never enough. Coast Paper and Supply, a proud member of Think Local First, is positively impacting our environment. They're providing green businesses with eco-friendly cleaners, food service products, and other biodegradable items. Coast Paper and Supply is located at 151 Josephine Street in Santa Cruz, and it's open weekdays, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. You can give them a call at 831-423-3350. That's 831-423-3350. Or visit CoastPaperSupplyInc.com. Michael Olson's first law of the food chain. Agriculture is the foundation upon which we build all our sandcastles. That's right, folks. No surplus of food, no sandcastles. So before we all get upset from the dust and noise of agriculture, let's get together Saturday at 9 a.m. as the Food Chain Radio Show goes behind the scenes of the industry that keeps us all civilized. If you have a comment about the first law of the food chain, tell me, Michael Olson, all about it at MetroFarm.com. Now, see you all on KSCO Saturday at 9 a.m. for some What's Eating What radio on the food chain. What day was that? Surfing Northern California for over 65 years. This is KSCO Santa Cruz. This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. 
big data at the speed of business. Welcome back to the second hour of the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and during the first hour, we had an opportunity to speak with popular Wall Street Journal columnist, author, and former speechwriter for Presidents Reagan and Bush, Miss Peggy Noonan. As you heard, Noonan started out as a news writer at CBS radio station in Boston uh, before moving up to becoming a producer for CBS News in New York, where she was responsible for Dan Rather's daily commentaries. She also taught journalism for a spell at New York University before going to work for President Reagan and then later Bush. I've been a fan of Miss Noonan's column in the Wall Street Journal for some time now. I think I should get that out (laughs) as quickly as possible, but... But that said, not necessarily because I agree with all of her observations, but I'm a fan because of her common sense. She seems to think see things the way normal, everyday people see things. Uh, she's, she's in touch with how we all feel. And so there's very little pretentiousness in her writing. It's authentic and honest and also full of feeling. And because Noonan is authentic, well, it's easy to respect her point of view, even on those occasions when I I may see the situation differently. Which brings me to an important point, and that is putting the love of fundamental principles, principles which are the very bedrock of a democratic way of life, principles such as a human being's right to free speech, religious freedom, uh, to defend themselves, to pursue happiness, putting these fundamental principles ahead of our self-interest. It's a requirement for our democratic way of life uh, to survive. Uh, We have to respect and also elevate these fundamental principles when, especially when, they disagree with our own beliefs and sometimes even threaten our safety. When Noonan wrote in a recent column in the Wall Street Journal that the Paris attacks caused you and I and the person on Main Street to suddenly realize this is not going to stop, I think she was right. I I did not watch the recent news coverage with the same sense of shock and horror and disbelief I had when I first saw the planes crash into the Twin Towers on 9-11. The shock was all gone, and it had been replaced by something much more disturbing. What I felt was dread. In the days it followed as the story spread to Brussels and the government shut down schools and stores because another attack was imminent, and as Bangladesh became the next victim, and as the news of more arrests in other countries began to surface, and support to stop the influx of Syrian refugees heated up. And France began more bombing raids in Syria, causing even more refugees to flee Syria for their lives. As I was watching all of this news coverage, I was one of the people Noonan wrote about in her column. I said to myself, this is not going to stop. But I'm not a defeatist. And the trouble I have with this is not going to stop is there's nowhere to go with that statement or that feeling. There's there's no to do, no action I can take, no way out. So what I did was add one small word to Peggy Noonan's phrase. I added the word until. This is not going to stop until. And suddenly, in an instant, doors began opening all over the place, and some were doors which uphold and value the principles of democracy, and some were not. For example, this is not going to stop until the government performs surveillance on every individual who prays at a mosque. Doesn't sound like something our founding fathers would applaud. Not even close. And next I tried on the statement, this is not going to stop until we stop all refugees from coming to the United States to find safety, freedom, and pursue happiness. Well, that doesn't sound like that'll stop ISIS either. It might add an extra measure of protection for you and me, 
But stop ISIS? You've got to be kidding. Let's not forget the two French citizens who were involved in the Paris attacks. So while Noonan was spot on about my reaction to the Paris attacks, and I did say to myself, this is not going to stop, what is important is how we and the leaders of the free world answer the next question, which is, it is not going to stop until what? It seems to me if we don't have an answer to that question in a hurry, there's a good chance we may carelessly trade our individual safety for the fundamental principles we claim to be defending. Religious freedom, free speech, the right to pursue happiness will all become provisional. So will the right to privacy. And is that where we're headed? Toward provisional freedom and rights? What I mean is that so long as you do not pray at a mosque, so long as you are not a refugee from Syria, so long as the NSA does not have metadata of long-distance calls to the Middle East or suspicious individuals, so long as you do not visit certain websites or post certain phrases or use certain keywords, you may enjoy the rights intended by our founding fathers. But otherwise, all bets are off. So my real question is this. Does provisional freedom answer the question, this is not going to stop until? Or does it deal a blow to the fundamental principles of democracy far greater than any random bomb or shooting? How much of our personal safety are we willing to risk to protect the principles our enemies aim to destroy? It seems to me that's the real question on the table. On that note, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, Charles Friedman and Bill Graff will be joining me for my weekly roundtable. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, registered pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. If somebody tells you about fruits and vegetables, sometimes people will use those terms as if it's one phrase. You can immediately assume that they really don't understand how the chemistry of food or the chemistry of vegetables work. Fruits are not vegetables. They're very, very different. Certainly, fruits have some value. Certainly, fruits have some nutritional entities in them, vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. But most of the good stuff in a fruit tends to be located in the peel. The middle part of a fruit is sugar for the most part. And these days, Fruits are selectively bred to be super high in sugar, and that's why you won't hear me saying fruits and vegetables. But vegetables, now those things are really, really important, and the bulk of our caloric intake needs to come from vegetables. The bulk of the caloric intake of a healthy diet is vegetable-based. Plants are exposed to a lot of solar energy. They're dependent on solar energy, and over the course of millennia, they have evolved chemical mechanisms that protect them from this electron, electricity-stealing ionizing property. Ionizing is the chemical term for ripping off an electron. It becomes an ion when it has a charge. A charge is developed by this ripping off this oxidation of electrical energy. In any case, when we eat plants, we are the beneficiaries of these wonderful evolutionary protective mechanisms that the plants have evolved. Now, vitamins, minerals, plant nutrients, these are all vital and indispensable foods because they contain antioxidants. Hi, this is Rebecca Costa, host of the Costa Report. If you'd like to get in touch with pharmacist Ben Fuchs, let me tell you the quickest, easiest way to communicate with the only pharmacist I know that isn't in a hurry to dispense pharmaceuticals. Sounds funny, doesn't it? A pharmacist who believes pharmaceuticals should be used as the last resort, not the first. You can reach pharmacist Ben right now at RadioBenHealth.com. That's RadioBenHealth.com. And if you'd like to know more about unique nutritional supplements like Beyond Tangy Tangerine or the Healthy Start Pack program, it's the same web address, RadioBenHealth.com. Find out why pharmacist Ben and millions like him are enjoying Enjoying a healthy, energetic lifestyle by adding mineral supplements to their daily routine. Visit RadioBenHealth.com, RadioBenHealth.com, and get started today. Big data is changing the way organizations work. From data-driven marketing and ad targeting to the connected car, big data is fueling product innovation and new revenue opportunities. It's creating a culture in which business and IT leaders join forces to realize value from all data. 
They infuse analytics everywhere and make speed a differentiator, gaining competitive advantage from faster, more informed decisions. Leading organizations are creating new business models, developing new roles, and defining new big data architectures, including an infrastructure that can manage and process exploding volumes of structured and unstructured data, in motion as well as at rest, while protecting data privacy and security. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, recent winners of the best sparkling wine in the U.S. in the Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championship. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. Now, many would say that Caraccioli Cellars was a dark horse in this worldwide competition. Definitely, we didn't expect for that to happen. Entering this competition is something I would do it just to get the tasting notes and the feedback from Tom. Tom Stevenson is the bubbles critic. He lives for sparkling wines across the world. And at the very beginning when we started this project, Michelle always said that Tom's opinion was the one that mattered the most in terms of if we're making good bubbles and if we're going in the right direction. And then to win awards and win best of class awards and ultimately the best sparkling